Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 86 of the Watch Rolling Podcast. The Watch Rolling Podcast is a veteran-owned podcast that focuses on horology from a veteran's point of view, as well as shares valuable veteran resources with the watch enthusiast community. My name is Jason. I'm your host. If you're new to the pod, welcome. And if you're returning, welcome back. As always, the pod is brought to you by the Anti-Watch Watch Club. The AWWC is a 501c3 charitable organization that utilizes a drop-style culture, produces all kinds of cool stuff, knowledgeing bottles, hoodies, t-shirts, you know, rash guards, the whole nine, and they benefit first responder, Leo, and veteran uh, charities with all the proceeds from that. Nobody draws a salary. I invite you to check them out, AWWC, and they're a great group of guys. Help them out. Also brought to you by Mushi Watch Traps. Mushi Watch has a veteran owned watch trap company that provides well built and fairly priced uh, nylon straps, watch rolls, the whole nine, you name it. You guys know I love them. They're great. Uh, nylon straps are my favorite uh, 20 millimeters. They work great. Um, just wonderful straps and a wonderful company, veteran owned. Uh, use the code uh, VET10 for 10% off your entire discount uh, or for a discount of your entire order. And uh, I invite you to check them out. Um, little disclaimer for this episode. It's a wonderful episode. It's, it's just I had so much fun. The interviews with Asha Wagner, for those who don't know, Asha's a fire captain. Um, her, I could go on and on with the accolades for Asha. She's done a million and one things and, you know, has lived to tell the tale, which is pretty fun. Um, and we're going to discuss her, her background, her, her, how she, how she watch enthuses. Uh, it's pretty awesome. And a uh, great conversation. The last minute of the episode, I think, her camera died, but her mic didn't or something happened where the last minute there's no video of her, but you can still hear her. So I apologize. I apologize. Ash. I'm going to let her know in a minute. Um, but it's a wonderful conversation. I invite you to check it out. Super interesting person, super interesting career. And, uh, it's just nice to know that there's people like this in the, in the hobby. And, uh, if you want to hear two firefighters geek out about stuff, then I invite you to check it out. Wonderful episode, episode 86, Asha Wagner. Without further ado, let's get into it. Hey, Asha, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, the, the honor is all mine. And I mean that. And uh, I normally don't like what they call fanboy over a certain <laughs> guest, but um, <laughs> anyone that I look at, they're, what they have going on professionally, and I have a mut- instant mutual respect for them. Um, and, and, you know, it's the firefighting thing. I can't, I can't lie. And, uh, but thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> yep. And uh, I would love to talk about you and your watches and what you have going on. But first, before I forget, Let's do a wrist check. And you being the guest of honor, what do you have on your wrist today? I've got my FXD Black with the <sighs> Nick Mankey dive strap on it. The one that the, has the loomed glow-in-the-dark stripe on it. Oh, really? Yeah. How do you like the Nick Mankey? I like it a lot. Because like, since it doesn't go underneath the case back, the watch just wears really just slim and comfortable. And um, I'm not worried about breaking a lug or a spring bar with yeah. this FXD. So. It's working out great. Yeah, you'd probably get your hand ripped off long before you ever broke those lugs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's how, that, that got dark really quick. But anyways, um, no, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> that's I just uh, I just ordered a couple of the Nick Mankey um, Kickstarter straps. Yeah, the Chrono Grips. I was testing one of those out. It's a good strap. I like it a lot. Nice. Yeah, I I, I was. I remember you, you mentioned something about that. So I was like, oh, let me go check because he had popped up a thing on his Instagram stories. And I was like, oh, man, let me go check this out. And uh, they had the titanium hardware ones. And then I just picked up the Squale 65th anniversary grade five titanium. Oh, I think I saw I think I saw that on the channel. The one that has yes. like slightly like vintage patina on the loom. And, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a thick it's a thick little thing. Um, but I've always wanted some grade five titanium. And I owned a Squale before, but it wasn't the right one. But this one's... It's right there, so it's going to hold me over until I get until I get my FXD black. But I have a whole plan for that, so you know it is what it is. But um, that's an awesome piece. That FXD black, I'm telling you, it's um, all the FXDs are cool. Yeah. You know, and we joke around that in a pinch, you could probably throw it, and like, if there was a button you needed to push across a room that was on fire, we we would joke around at work that you could probably throw it, and it would hit the button and then do whatever you got to do and then not break. <laughs> you know, with good aim and the proper application of force and sound. You could probably make that happen. Yeah, you probably could. You probably could. Um, on my wrist, I have my uh, Seamaster Planet Ocean nice. the reference. Oh, yeah. With the with one of the links that Tom placed from Expedition 16610 shot me so it fits on my wrist. But uh, I, uh, oh, man, always was a dream of mine. It wears so well for a 45.5. Um, 
but I have a large wrist. I have a seven and like five eighths inch wrist. The problem is my hands are super, I didn't realize how wide they were. Mm-hmm. And so a lot, I've been ordering um integrated bracelet watches and they don't fit over my hand. So I'm kind of like having to sell them back, which stinks. But you know, that's what I got on my wrist today. How many we're not the- here to talk about my ridiculously wonky hands. We're well, here to talk about you. Those- I'm, I'm curious though, how many of the integrated bracelets have like a, a decent micro address adjust with them? I wonder if that would help well, out with it. And that's the thing is I think I bought a bunch of older ones, vintage ones. Mm-hmm. So I have a, I have a, you know, a, a, basically a gold pogue. Um, that bracelet didn't work. The Alanga pogue bracelet I have for that, which is freaking beautiful. It's a, it's an actual uh, U S Navy chief petty officer's Alanga pogue bracelet that was purchased at an estate sale or found in an estate sale in Hawaii. And a uh, shout out, shout out my boy, Speedy Fett. Speedy Fett hooked me up with it. Nice. And, uh, I offered to buy it. He's like, nah, man, have it. And uh, my hands are stretching out. And then I have a Zenith Defy Surf 1975. And I bought that from one of the TGN members. Shout out, Paul. Because that's my fiscal birth year. Yeah. So I kind of cheated it. Like I was born in 74, <laughs> but I was born in fiscal year 75. So I was <laughs> like, this works. And a beautiful watch. Oh, my gosh, man. Beautiful watch, but my hands, no matter what I do, my hands too big and it's stretching that integrated bracelet out and there's no micro adjust. And I'm worried that these pieces are so nice that if I just keep doing it, eventually I'll ruin it a for myself and anyone else that could possibly wear it in the future. And I would just feel bad about, you know, if someone has a seven inch wrist and like a smaller hand, they could wear this watch and be super happy. I'm just going <laughs> to destroy it over time. You know what I mean? It's a, uh, it's a, uh, Oh no, man. It's like some kind of weird watch morality, but you know, it's, it's hit me there. So, <laughs> but yeah, no, but that's it. So I think, uh, I, I, I've seen some modern ones that I'm really interested in with micro adjust, but I think what I'll end up doing is going something like one of the Alpina extremes. I get that look, you know, rubber straps mm-hmm. and then go from there and I don't have to worry about it. And I still get that kind of vibe yeah. from it kind of thing, you which are pretty nice. The California dollar. Yeah. You mentioned Squally. Oh. Did you see the one that was the that had like the shark bite out of the sec out of the minute hand? No. Which one was that? It was a super brief limited edition, sold out really quickly. It was just it has the shark on the logo coming up just a little bit more than the than the little hatch mark, <laughs> and it has like this yeah. bite taken out of the second hand. It's super cool. Oh man. I'm gonna go check it out when we get done. Well, tomorrow morning. But um <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely check it out. Yeah, that's awesome. It, it you know, and I really, really like, I'm pretty particular about logos and stuff, but there's something about the Squale shark, you know, saying Squale shark is kind of redundant too, but yeah. like the seeing the little Squale. Yeah. yeah it's, it's pretty fun. It's a, it's fun. They they make good stuff, man. I really enjoy them. But, um, so we've discussed, you know, you're a firefighter, I guess, I guess, Asha, whatever your professional background, cause I know you've been on other shows and it's been, it's been spoken about ad nauseum, but I guess if you can just give us the, you know, whatever version you feel like you're not being super, you know, repetitive for yourself of your, of your thing. I think it's important for my audience to hear though, because it's pretty stinking impressive, but whatever you want to give, you're welcome. Well, um, so basics for my role right now is I work for a municipal city fire department. I'm a fire captain. I've been with my current department for 23 years now. Currently the captain of a truck company and a hazardous materials company. And I'll go into the differences between like engine company and truck company a little bit. But awesome. um, for the hazmat side of things, uh, we handle pretty much anything that falls under like the the, the sea burning stuff. So that's chemical, biological, uh, radiological, nuclear, and explosives. And um, for uh, truck company operations, so... When, he's, when there's a fire, the engine is generally the smaller of the two vehicles that people think of with fire apparatus that carries hose and water. So they will go inside with the hose. Their job is to find the fire, put it out. On a truck company, we do a lot of the other support operations around, around the fire. So uh, forcible entry. If there's a door that's locked, then we will break it so that the engine crew can get inside access the fire. Um, our next primary goal is search and rescue. If there's anybody, mm. any people, 
pets, anything that's alive in the house, we're going to go in there and get it out. Um, I will shut off the utilities to the house so that we don't have to worry about, you know, electrical lines or gas lines as they're poking holes in walls trying to find the fire. Um, we'll also go up to the roof, chainsaws, cut a hole in the roof to perform ventilation so that lets fire and hot gases and the smoke out of the structure, it increases visibility and survivability for everybody that's inside. And then afterwards, um, we'll do what's called salvage and overhaul. So once there's like a decent amount of knockdown on the fire, I'll, you know, face to face with the the occupants, find out, you know, what are their, some of their important belongings, go in there, get them out. Um, a lot of times it's like things that can't be replaced. So I look for, you know, photo albums, stuff like that. Make sure I can get the phones oh, nice. up to them so they can call people. And then just, uh, or poking holes in walls, making sure that we, that the fire is actually out. It's not hanging out there because rekindle is a dirty, dirty word. I want to make sure yeah, we don't have yeah. to go back out. <laughs> yeah. We call it reflash. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, but no, you're right. Cause that overhaul process, man, like if you don't really, really fine tooth it, you're going to take, you know, you got to be quick, but smooth, mm-hmm. and, you know, and then understanding. And like I always say, and like, we had this discussion before, like, I don't know how you, I don't know how you guys do it because you've never been in that house before. And like for us, those of us on a ship, you know, we're, we're probably familiar roughly with that space. You know, we have metal bulkheads and sometimes they have insulation, but like you have no idea the construction of that house and what they did. You know what I mean? Like that bulk, that wall could be like three feet thick with a bunch of BS, you know, and you're digging through it. So it's always impressive to hear what you guys do. Or modern construction, it can be really, really thin. Who knows how structurally sound that is once <laughs> it starts burning. But yeah, no, I started watching home inspection videos once and I stopped because I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't need to know. I don't need to know this stuff. Yeah. No, but so, so that's awesome. So that's like the basic, and I don't want to say basic, like short selling it, but that's like mm-hmm. the basic firefighting stuff. So what, so you talked about CBR. CBR, uh, C Bernie. So CBR. C Bernie. Mm-hmm. So we're still way back in the day where we say CBR. Yeah. Still in the Navy, you know, so chemical, biological, radiological. But um, I find it interesting that you you also add the E for explosive on there. Mm-hmm. So so what role do you have or you and your unit have in that? Well, our bomb squads, of course, have the primary um, role when it comes to explosives. Uh, when we go out there, we can um, support them. So they'll go in. Well, we had one uh, a, little, a little while ago where it was a device that was that was found. The bomb squad went in and made sure that it was deactivated. Then we went in and sampled the material inside to confirm that it actually oh, was wow. an explosive. And uh, we've, we've all been, we've been trained in like the FBI 12 step sampling method. So mm-hmm. what that means is that we can either do a public safety sample where find out if there's anything, are there any WMDs or anything else that we need to worry about that can harm the public. So that's just like a quick down and dirty. And then we can also take evidentiary samples and package it up, maintain chain of custody so that that can go off to court if need be. I think that's interesting. That's an interesting point at the end. Like um, it, some people call it chain of custody, whatever you want to call it. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not just, um, I think the general public sometimes thinks you just go in like Arnold Schwarzenegger and you're just like, you know, like going crazy. It's like, no man, there's like a, there's a series of steps we have to follow. Yeah. And like, <laughs> and, and how we clean up quote unquote at the end is very important too. Yeah. You know, because we tell people all the time, like, um, like, you know, in the Navy for communications, you know, we have written and oral communications, right. Written and verbal, but like all of our written stuff, we have charts, you know, that we write on with grease pencils. All that stuff is legal. Yeah. There, there are legal items. They, they will be pulled for an investigation afterwards. So I can't even imagine something with like a explosive or a bomb. And then how you guys go about accounting for all that. And then what you document, because heaven forbid you forget one thing. You know, because it happens to everybody because we're all yeah. human. Yeah, document so, like crazy and uh, don't take pictures on our personal cell phones because <laughs> that can be called into court. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. It's, uh, no, I mean, see, and it's, and I think this is the great stuff for the general public to hear too. And and I hate to say it, but especially for military people too, because we could have a whole podcast on that because yeah. there's a lot of people who go from the military spectrum that are firefighters or quarter, you know, because in the, in the Navy, every sailor is a firefighter we're all qualified at the base level to, to, to do some very basic stuff for firefighting. And I think that they think that 
they're just going to roll out of the Navy and go be a fighter fighter in the civilian world. I'm like, it's not that, it's not that simple. Like it's, you know, the, the whole system is set up differently and rightfully so because it's much more, there's many more tangible, I don't know what do you want to call it? Mathematical variable. opportunities for things to screw you up. Yeah. Very old. Thank you. I just forgot the English language for about five seconds, but um, yeah. yeah and I think it's time. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, uh, I just think it's awesome. And, um, but so, so now we have your, you know, in the, like I said, a very basic background. And for those of you listening, you're going to get much more as we tell these stories, but how did this awesome path lead into a road of the love of watches and horology? Well, um, the first time that I was required to wear a, a watch for my job was when I was doing wildland before I got hired on. So I spent six seasons with, um, <laughs> Sorry, little puppy butt right there. <laughs> uh, good to go. We love uh, dogs on watch rolling. Perfect. Uh, I spent six seasons working for both uh, the U.S. Forest Service and California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, so CDF. It's called Cal Fire now. But um, I had to wear a watch back then, one, to when we responded to medical calls, to take vital signs, and then also, you know, it was, it was a time before cell phones were really that popular. So um, just to coordinate basic movements and meeting up, um, you know, it's on the helicopter and coordinating when the helicopter would be landing at the helispots, returning back, um, crew pickups. So just had to have a watch for, for that. But I really didn't like wearing it because uh, I played, played volleyball since I was 12, played it all through college. And for volleyball, you can't have anything on your wrist. And, you know, at the time, I just kind of, saw watches as something that would get in the way versus being like a true tool. And so it wasn't until I started the promotional process to captain when I was interacting with my watch a lot more, because then I, like we were talking about earlier, have to document everything that happens on a call yeah. and, and timestamp it. So when my medic would give a medication, we have some medications that you have to give every three to five minutes. So I have to write that down, let them know when it was time for the next one. Um, when you get back, have to write it up. So that's when I really started becoming interested in watches. Oh yeah. It's uh how much of a, you know, in, in the Navy, there's certain things where we expect certain things to happen at certain times. How much of that exists in a civilian firefighting capacity? Because I don't think a lot of people also realize that you're not just firefighters. I mean, some of you are EMTs, some of you are paramedics, yep. some of you are this, some of you are that. So when you have one of these casualty situations, you have more than just a fire. Isn't just a fire. There's medical stuff. There could be, like you said, explosive stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so how many at any given time, like on a base situation, how many different people are tracking different time stuff in, just in general? Primarily just the captains are tracking okay. the times, but then we let the rest of the crew know. Um, yeah, there's there's a decent amount of other situations where we're tracking. Oh, so for hazardous materials entry, mm -hmm. I have uh, I'll be like the overall probably hazmat group supervisor most of the time. So I'm kind of running the hazmat call, but then I have my, my entry team leader is tracking the times for the, the entry team that's going in because we have to do air okay. checks for them at regular intervals because we have a, a, a bottle. It's, it's rated for an hour, but you know, if you're breathing yeah. and, and working harder then you can burn through it quicker. So we check in at regular intervals to see how much air they have because we want to have a third of the bottle to get in and work, a third of the bottle to get out, and a third for safety. So yeah, we check in to let them know when their turnaround time is going to be. Yeah, and it's crazy too because you know based on a person's physical build and you know how experienced they are, some people mm -hmm. some people are so calm they breathe slower. Yeah, you know, um, some places do drills where you practice on breathing slower in situations of major duress. And then some people are just like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and you're like, man, this is like the 14th time where you've like sucked <laughs> down your bottle, like the first 10 minutes, you know? And uh, so it, it, it's just interesting because like, you don't think about it with watches. I mean, I think that's in the Navy, like why G-Shocks are such a big thing because we, we move G-Shocks like, you know, cartels move illicit drugs. I mean, it, it's because they're affordable, they're durable, they last, but you can track times on them. You know, in like our SCBAs in the Navy, we have, you know, timers on them and all this stuff. And we have people tracking time. But the ability to actually look at your own wrist and track your own stuff is also helpful and be coordinated with everybody else, too. Yeah. And I think that's interesting. 
And one of the reasons why I like mechanical watches is, you know, I start out with uh, Timex and use G-Shock before. I like the loom on mechanical watches, just yeah. standard analog, because that way I don't have to worry about pressing a button to get it to light up when I need it to. Yeah. And I think, I think that people that uh, want to do loom checks should really send them to people like you because real civilian firefighters, et cetera, et cetera. And then people that actually dive, I think should be the real authorities on loom. You know, me at my desk, I'm a certified desk diver. <laughs> Um, but I'm actually, I've actually been looking into going and getting my diving certificate to start diving. But um, I think that, you know, in a smoky environment, a dark environment, because there's sometimes like, you know how it is, you can't see your hand in front of your face. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty rough. There's, there's a- okay. So you were, t- you were talking about your first time of having to wear a watch and how you didn't like yeah. wearing watches. And you shared an interesting story with me uh, where you were doing wildland firefighting in Big Sur. Yeah. And there was some. Some cool stuff. Would you mind sharing that story with everybody? Oh, sure. So, you know, down there, we used to joke that the poison oak was, you know, biologically engineered by the military base next door because it was just extra virulent. <laughs> yeah. For for a while, for me, it's like it didn't feel like summer unless I had poison oak. You know, it was just mm. went with it. And, and this was also part of the reason why I didn't want to wear a watch is because my assistant captain came into work one day saying that, his wife had this little strip of poison oak in her back and they realized it was because when he got back from work, he gave her a, a hug. She was wearing a sundress and he had poison oak on his watch and it just rubbed off right in the middle of her back. Mm. So I'm just like, I don't want anything that could be carrying poison oak or just, just get it off of me as soon as I get back. And that's one of the cardinal sins too, is you don't want to get poison oak inside your sleeping bag. So you got to make sure that you yeah. like fully decon before you go to bed at night because that oil can survive for up to a year on surfaces. Oh, wow. What's your kit like for wildland firefighting? Like when you, I'm pretty sure it's different based on different situations, but like the standard kit, how much, how much are you carrying out there? Well, when I was on, on engine crews, um, my pack had, it weighed about 40 pounds. When I was on the helicopter, okay. it was 25 pounds because we were a little bit more weight conscious. But, okay. Yeah, I got to imagine. I mean, like, you know, you hear about all the time people say, you know, do I really need this? Do I really need that? You know, and, uh, yeah, no, I I hear you. Water, had an MRE or two back there, uh, had a file, always had to keep the tools sharp. Sawyers would have saw saw gas with them and tools to work on the saws. Yeah. Yeah, because you guys are carrying, like, real, like, woodland stuff you need to. Mm -hmm. And that's just, uh, yeah. Cause we, you know, yeah, it's just, a, like I said, we were joking about this earlier. We could probably, we could probably have like a series. Now the more I think about it, we could probably have a series of podcasts, like a 10, a 10 part series on like firefighting, you know, intricacies across the way. It. But yeah, I mean, let's just do it. Screw it. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting because, because once you start thinking about it, you're like, man, like, you know, what would I really bring? And I'd probably be, if I went out with you, I'd show up and you'd be like, no, you don't need that. <laughs> You don't need that. You know, you don't need that. And then like, if you came with me on a ship, I'd probably be like, no, you don't need that. You know what I mean? Kind of thing. Um, it was funny when it, I was on probation my first couple of years, it, it looked like I had an REI in my turnout pockets. I had like ropes <laughs> and carabiners and like all this other stuff. I've just, I've scaled down so much now. <laughs> yeah. You're just like, doing, well, I mean, yeah. Experience. I mean, sometimes, you know, the more you gain an experience, the less you need in kit. And it's because you understand, you know, and then someone, might also have, you know, you pick and choose among the team and you know, someone's going to have something else that you may not need to carry. But then again, there's always that one call where you could have used it. <laughs> oh yeah. No, no. you're. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. I know you're right. Um, you, you, in, um, you, you had mentioned previously about, you know, you begin to learn as, about watches as historical tools. Yeah. And is there anything that's particular that like, that kind of sparked something with you that kind of, you know, made it the watches seem more important or curved you to wearing them more or was it just in general? Well, um, yeah, once I saw how they were used as backup timer or they were used as timers for dives and, um, you know, the, like the Navitiver being used by pilots and of course the, what was the Apollo 13 mission with the speedy stuff yeah. like that. Um, just that love historical tools and like, okay, now I understand this. And yeah. And especially being a firefighter, I mean, we 
hold tradition very, very dear. We yeah. have a, you know, one of our standard sayings is like 165 years of tradition unimpeded by progress. I and mean, we still have hay bales on the engine, like the hay bale yeah. hooks, because we yeah. use them for flaming mattresses and stuff. But it's it's a leftover from the time when they used to have horses to draw the engines. Yeah. And so we've like still found a use for them. And yeah. so, you know, just vintage tools just you know, strike a chord with me. Yeah, no, I, I understand what you mean, because we have the same thing, you know, shoring, like, you know, wooden shoring on board a ship or metal shoring. And there's stuff you can do to, like, you know, secure bulkheads or we, we call bulkheads or what else called walls. So, you know, we can strengthen stuff. And these things are really old tools, you know, like I would say even our firefighting nozzles, if you look at them, you know, are freaking old. And but they're tried and tested, right? They're going to pump you out. You know, it's a 150 gallons per minute, a thousand mm-hmm you know, you know, whatever, 150 PSI, thousand gallons per minute. And you're going to put some water down range with that, you know, if you need to, but if you look at them, they look like they're from like the 1920s. Just they essentially chunks, are. Yeah. Big chunks of brass that probably still work great. Yeah. So you have some cool watch stories. You've shared with me like one of your better watch stories. And I think it's a great story for everyone to hear. So why don't you share with us one of your better watch stories? Let me grab the, Grab a couple watches for that one. Yeah, do what you got to do. We're here for it. Sure. I just want to say I love your background. I love the old oh, school awesome. license plate. Thanks. Like the little motorcycle thing and the, the cool pictures. It's very nice. I actually got that license plate when my wife and I were back over in, um, we were in Austria and just happened to this antique store. And it's, it was just a funny story in by itself because there was a, a guy that was there and, and, um, you know, he was super friendly, said hi, and then after a while, he's like, you know what, I've got to leave for a little bit, but my mom should be back in a little bit, and he just left us in the store. It's like, <laughs> hey, this is a little different. And then yeah. his mom came back and finds the three of us in the store and comes up to us and goes, would you all like a glass of wine? I'm like, yes. Yes, we yes. Had <laughs> And then we found this license plate, and it's a California license plate that somehow ended up in Austria. It's from... Wow. Um, the yeah 1939 yeah it's, it's the like, old oh. it's the black and gold one yeah yeah oh. those are freaking sweet yeah like well we should just bring this back home it's meant to be yeah yeah sometimes you have those serendipitous moments where you just got to score it and keep it moving yeah let's see oh there is one more watch oh yeah no worries Sorry. so for years this was my standard work watch. It's a staying in dark professional, um, co-branded with triple out design. And nice. this is just a great watch. I love that it has the GMT hand on there. Most of the time I just leave that for, um, you know, just to, for 24 hour time. Cause I do all my yeah. reports in, in military time. And so I was at the, down at our local PD's bomb range where, doing some experiments with some dirty bomb stuff, you know, for radiological testing and, and containment. And I noticed that one of the FBI WMD techs had a, um, uh, an MN FXD. And so I struck up with a conversation and this was like early 2022 or it might've even been 2021. So like they had just come out and it was the first time that I had seen one out in the wild. And so we struck up a conversation and uh, we swapped watches for the training just to nice. test out because he really liked mine. I liked his. And then we stayed in touch ever since then. And then that summer he was traveling in Europe and he, um, he went into a consignment shop just randomly. He wasn't even looking for watches, but he saw two of them, two watches there. Uh, one was a vintage IWC from the 50s, and then the other one was a lost navigator from the 70s. And wow. both were RAF issued watches, and he really wanted the IWC. And looking at the uh, lost navigator, I'd never heard of it before. Yeah, that piece yeah. is freaking sweet. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I and love it. it. I started doing some research on it, and it turns out the reason it's called the lost navigator is because um, nobody knows who made it. It was in the transitional period between uh, Hamilton and CWC for being issued. So it was only 
issued during my birth year of 1976, and about 2,000 of them were made. And I'm like, that is just the perfect quiet professional watch. It just yeah. does, it, does its job, no fanfare. I mean, there's not even anything on the inside that says who made it. It was just purpose-built. And so as my buddy was um, buying these watches, I just texted him real quick, like, hey, since they're on consignment, can you get the contact information of the guy that's selling them? And he was able to, and he met up with that guy for about an hour over lunch, and they were just sharing stories and talking. And it turns out that the guy was a former 82nd Airborne, and then he went over oh, wow. to went over to England, joined the SAS, and he wore the watch that I just showed you while they were while he was uh, intercepting and decoding secret messages from the Russians during the Cold War. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, it was just that's awesome. Yeah, it was so much fun. So interesting thing about the Sangin. Um, I owned a Sangin at one time, and I'll eventually have another one in my collection. This one just wasn't, you know, I moved it on to another party. But I think it's interesting that you literally track the same time zone that you're in with the 24 hour mm -hmm. one as a yeah. tool. And I think that's, I think that's like the most practical thing I've ever heard. And I've heard multiple people say it, but no one in the watch community talks about that. They, 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 and I get it. They romanticize that GMT hand, but I've always said like, no, man, I know people that use it literally for the same time zones they're in because they use 24 hour or military time for reporting. Yeah. And I think that's something that's kind of lost, but it's like inside baseball kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like when you, when you, the second I heard you say that, I was like, I mean, I already knew you got it. Like I've known you got it for a long time, but I was like, Oh no, she really gets it. Like, but you know, I already knew you got it, but I'm like, no, she really gets it. And, uh, and then the other thing was I can't stress serendipity enough in the, I, I guess you could do it with any hobby. I guess you could, but especially in the watch world for like you and your wife to go to freaking Austria, right? Yeah. California license plate, your buddy to be overseas, to, to be, you know, in a consignment shop and two watches, not just one, two. And he has lunch with the guy. And I guarantee you that gentleman just wanted to know that those watches were going to a good home. And I know your buddy yeah, probably you. wasn't trying to sell it. He was just being genuine. Yeah. You know, and the, the guy who was consigned, him was like, yeah, we're going to make this deal. You know what I mean? It's just awesome. It's the best stories kind of thing. Yeah. That's, that's actually one of the reasons that one of the things that really got me into watches and the initial interest was um, finding out about them as historical tools. But then when I started mm -hmm. finding the, about the stories behind them, that's what really yeah. hooked me. No, and, and the stories are great too because it's it's weird being an interviewer, right? Because it's it's like I kind of lived vicariously through you through some of your posts. Like I'm not being brutally honest. You know, there there was a time and place where I was doing that stuff. And it's like, you know, like I was talking to my wife the other night, and it's like, you know, part of me, like I have a buddy of mine who was a pilot and he's getting ready to retire. He's still active duty. He's an 06 helicopter pilot who'd done some hairy stuff and he's getting ready to retire and he's trying to reconcile the fact he's not going to do this anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, it's, it's weird, man, because part of you knows you shouldn't be doing it, but the other part of you knows that you really miss doing it. And if you had the opportunity to go do it again, no matter how dangerous it would be, you, you and I both know, you would do it in like two seconds. Yeah. And so being able to watch you with your watches and the stuff you're doing, and by all accounts, you know, what I consider to be um, some pretty cool opportunities based on merit. And, and I'm going to say that again, based on merit, it's just, it's just really fun to watch. And I get to watch someone who I professionally respect and now personally respect because I've got to know you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, build these stories with your timepieces. So, so the day when it happens, when we sit down and break bread, whether it's in Napa or in the Virginia wine country, because we have one. Yes, I got to check that out too. Yeah, it's pretty snazzy. And <laughs> we'll give you the whole tour. And um, I'll be able to look at your timepieces and then be like, you know, that's Asha. You know, this is, 
This is her story. And it's, and it's pretty cool. I, I think it's the, it's the very best thing about the whole, the whole watch thing for me. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. So, so let's transition back to your professional stuff real quick. Cause I think this is always cool. Um, and there's going to be some cool stuff in here. I think it relates to a lot of kids, but not a lot of kids actually carry it out. But how did you become interested in firefighting? Uh, well, the first job that I remember wanting to do when I was you know, like itty bitty in preschool was um, firefighting. And then somewhere along the line, I really wanted to be an astronaut. And uh, that just kind of led to a love of airplanes and anything that flies. And like, well, if I'm going to be a pilot, I want to have some fun when I'm up there. I don't want to just, you know, take <laughs> off, go from point A to point yeah. B. And so then I found out about um, aerial tanker fire, firefighting. And yeah. that just seems like an incredible job. And so during the, the 89 Hills fire, that came within a, about three quarters of a mile of my house. So I got to see the tankers flying, flying over just up yeah. close and personal. I'm like, yes, that's what I want to do. It was just absolutely killing me to just stay, stay home. I was like packed up waiting to see if we need to evacuate. And like, I don't want to be here right now. I want to be up there, you know, making yeah. a difference and just doing something to help out. But, you know, still being in high school, parents, there was no way they were going to let me run up into the hills. I had a neighbor who hopped on his bike right away as soon as the fire started and went up there. But parents like, no, you stay here. You yeah. stay with us. And um, so I, when I went to college, I majored in um, forestry and natural resources with a concentration in wildland firefighting. And uh, one of my professors helped me out, was able to get a job during the summers working for the U.S. Forest Service. And then that led to eventually I was able to get a job on a, a helicopter crew as a helicopter repeller, which which is a very, very fun way to get to a fire. <laughs> yeah. So that was, That's pretty awesome. Yeah. That, that was, so, that was so, so how old were you when you went to college to, to start this path? And And I have, there's a reason behind my questioning, but like, how old were you when you started and how old were you when you finished college? Um, I was 18 when I started college and I worked my first season for Forest Service when I was 19. See, okay. And then, con A, congratulations. Thank and this you. is the reason why I asked this. So, so my wife's a teacher and at like 18, she knew she wanted to be a teacher. And at 24, she had her master's for teaching. And what I tell her is, so now you might be the second person I know other than my wife who at a young age... A, knew what they wanted to do. B, it was hard, right? And C, accomplished it at a young age, which put them on the path of having these wonderful careers, right? Accomplished careers. And I think it's just something I like to talk about because like the majority of us people in the military, we join the military because we don't know what the F we want to do, right? And then like we stumble into these jobs. Like not all of us, but I would say mathematically, the majority of us are like, Oh, okay, I guess I'll be a I'll be a firefighter in the Navy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and then like twenty years later, we're like, oh, now I get to go start the rest of my life and figure out what it is I actually want to do. And then most of us end up doing something that we don't actually want to do, but we're just kind of good at it and we do it. So I just think that that's it. to see that as a child and to see the stuff going on as a teenager and you know you want to do something and to go actually accomplish that based off that. You know, I think it just speaks volumes, A, to character, and B, to, like, the amount of effort you're going to put into what you're doing, number two, which I think is important because I get, you probably know this more than me. There's probably a bunch of people like you or similar to you with that ethos in your service. Well, you you know, know, it's it's funny because sometimes I'll go out to, re to job recruitment fairs and a lot of times the folks that are coming in to the recruitment fairs are just looking for an office job. So after a while I started recruiting the military recruiters like, Hey, yeah. so what are y'all doing when you get out of the service? Thought about the fire yeah. service? I mean, it's yeah. just, I see it as a natural transition. Oh yeah. And, and that's a, and that's a cool thing because there are like, um, man, I, I, I gotta believe it's, I, I, so there was a sailor of mine in uh you know, Vanessa may not watch a podcast, but you know, she came in, was a great sailor. She was a firefighter like us. She was, she worked for me. 
And she got out. And the last time I checked, she was a Virginia Beach firefighter. You nice. Know, pretty accomplished one because that's what she always wanted to do. Now, her mom, I think, was a paramedic. And then if I remember correctly, her sister had done some kind of form of service, like public service. You know, but that's what that was her fastball. That's what she always wanted to do. And because she cared about it so much, her level of performance was so much higher, you know, cause I hate to say it in the military, we rank people. I mean, we rank them. That's what we do, you know? And like mm-hmm. her level of performance, you couldn't deny it because that passion was there. She, she formulated a plan. She, you know, it was, she was doing something she loved to do, but it supported the mission so much that you couldn't deny like the great, the inherent greatness there. You know what I mean? Like of what yeah. she was doing. And I think that that, um, I just think it's important for the general public to know that because when you have a group of people like yourself in your group doing that, they should feel much more comfortable knowing who it is that's protecting them. It's not a bunch of hacks. Yeah. And I think sometimes like when you watch popular television, <laughs> fictional media, there's, it's a bunch of hacks. There, Yeah. There's a lot of questionable questionable actions that happen on tv shows <laughs> <laughs> very questionable and, and, and you know and, and, and people gotta make a buck i get it but um mm-hmm. i just want to say you know it's like there are you along with your you know constituents accomplished you know professional professionals and i think it's important to get that out there which i think is why there's so much respect from the watch community for people like you, because it's like, we glamorize a lot of what you actually go out and accomplish. And I like to keep that line there. Right. Mm -hmm. I feel it's important not to poo poo the people that glamorize it just to say, when you go out and pay for a three day camp where they run you through some firefighting drills does not make you a firefighter. And I think it's important to keep that line there because I think some people blur it and I would, I can't allow that to happen on my watch, but that's just oh, me. But um, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. We already talked about it. I'd go fire fire with you any day of the week and you could tell me wherever you want me to put the hose and I'll just, I'll knock it out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but uh, one of my favorite things is your Instagram username. Wildlander six. And, uh, I've always felt there was like a story behind it, but now that I know the story, why don't you share it with the listeners, the the origin of Wildlander six, how it relates to your pretty stinking sweet Instagram feed. Well, um, the number six, we were as helicopter repellers, we were, um, all assigned numbers so that anytime we take off and land on the helicopter, they would report that to our dispatch so that they would have a record of who was on board. And that way, if anything happened to the helicopter, if it were to crash, then they could notify our families before the media got a hold of our names. And um, when, as repellers, you know, we'd hop out on the line, and and generally we were supposed to go down um, pretty slowly because if the the ropes are made out of nylon, if we go through too fast, then the friction could kind of melt the rope a little bit. But they would always tell us that if we looked up at the helicopter, if we heard any noises, like a loud bang, saw smoke coming from the helicopter, we were just supposed to get to the down as, as quickly as possible. Because um, one of uh, the jobs of our spotter up top, he had a little knife in his vest, like a little um, seatbelt cutter. And so if anything went wrong with the ship, one of the first things that he would do was cut our ropes. And it's basically mm-hmm. just sacrifice the repellers to save the ship. So that it doesn't get hung up on trees and stuff as it's crashing. Yeah. So, yeah. Like maybe we just have like a eh, 30 foot fall or something like that just to get down for lucky. I mean, <laughs> or the highest that we would repel out from our ropes were 300 feet. So, depending on the terrain, but just mm. get to the ground as quick as we can. And actually, the, the helicopter on the, at my station the season before um, crashed. And, yeah. Um, in that one, the pilot was, um, he had a, what's called a Bambi bucket underneath the ship. So mm-hmm. he was dipping out of a lake and came up and was uh, racing back to the fire and the bucket hit a tree 
uh, flipped up over the tail boom, sheared the tail rotor off, and then the water in the bucket as it came down yanked the helicopter out of the sky. Right. The pilot mm. lived, which I was super thankful about. And then um, that summer that I was working, um, a helicopter crashed that that summer too. And thankfully that pilot lived as well. Um, he just was uh, dipping out of a lake and flew into uh, two sets of power lines. Oh, wow. On his way up. And then we had a critical incident stress briefing for that one. And they brought a, an, I think a, a Vietnam vet in to, to talk with us through our, through the briefing. And one of the things that he was saying is like, you know, helicopters just weren't meant to fly. They're basically <laughs> just rocks with propellers that beat the air into submission. It's, it's just a wonder that they stay in, in the air at all. Like, dude, you're talking about my ride home. This is not comforting. Yeah. <laughs> That's but, gotta be crazy. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, if you ever get offered a ride in a Navy helicopter, I would just tell you that if you see hydraulic fluid leaking, <laughs> um, their set of standards is slightly different than everyone else's. So, you know, what, um, they're going to tell you, we were not allowed <laughs> to ride in military helicopters. Yeah, it's, it's, we were told because the army didn't have hours ratings for their parts and they would just, <laughs> run things until they failed and yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know when things fail in a helicopter that, that could be a problem oh and my um <laughs> when actually let me tell you this, I'll, I'll tell you a story in a second but i gotta plug in my ipad my my uh, battery's getting we'll just a little in. low so let me just do plug that real in. quick <laughs> it's cool because i'm pretty sure uh there's nothing i love more than a good helicopter story because <laughs> We we don't ride in, like you know us as you know surface firefighters we don't ride them all the time but I'm gonna tell mm -hmm. you what I've only ridden them ridden in a helicopter to a ship probably like 15 times every single time I've had to think about why my will wasn't updated before I hopped in this helicopter <laughs> and it's and then the people in the helicopter crew would say things to me or to us as a group that I'm like what. What, are you serious? Like, is this, is this really happening right now? And yeah, but yeah, let's hear the story. Uh, can you hear me all right still? I had to, you sound I had to perfectly my... fine. Perfect. Okay. So, um, well, my parents were coming to visit. I had gone around and told everybody on the crew, like, okay, just don't tell them about the crash just yet. You know, they're, they're, they're still getting used to me working on the helicopter. And mm -hmm. uh, I forgot that we had a relief pilot that was coming into work that day. Uh -huh. Before I knew it, he was describing not only last year's crash in um, in full detail to my to my parents, but then he went yeah. on to describe his three hard landings, as he put it. <laughs> and I would have been so mad at him, but I just I had to laugh because I had never seen my mom that shade of pale before. <laughs> yeah, it's just like I can imagine your mom's face was like this. She was like, "Oh, yes, all the blood just drained out." It's like yeah. I, I didn't want to tell him all this just yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's crazy um we we had something happen one time that made me decide to call my mom from the ship on deployment and this is back when it was like three dollars a minute to call this was like in the mid 90s mm -hmm. and you had a three second delay so i remember calling my mom and she's like hello i'm like hey mom one two and she's like she's like hey mijo what's up i'm like one two three i'm like oh i just called to tell you i love you mom she goes what's wrong two. she's like okay i love you too <laughs> talk to you soon she hung up the phone right because for the record my mom's the best phone talker ever she never wants to talk very long on the phone but she knew something was wrong and um uh, it's just uh it's those little things that make you do stuff like that but um oh yeah so um talking about helicopters uh i i want to hear the eddie story and i think everyone should hear the eddie story too because i think it's a great story and uh but hearing you say it's gonna be even better yeah so that same pilot that was um, that was describing his three hard landings to my mom, he was a phenomenal pilot. Um, there was actually one time was where we were um, going out practice for a training repel, and there was a um, approaching thunderstorm. So when I stepped on the skids, it was super gusty and windy, and the ship was just doing this. And I was just kind of like hanging on to the outside of the mm -hmm. ship line, like, oh, this is different. This is a little interesting. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, as soon as I got on the rope, it was totally solid and fine. I wasn't moving around at all. 
and I realized that what he was doing up top, he was counteracting the the gusts of wind so that we would be fine on the line. Yeah. So, and I didn't quite realize just how amazing of a pilot he was until he came into work all pissed off one day. And we were asking, like, Eddie, what's wrong? It's like, some crazy dude in Tibet just broke my record for the highest altitude rescue. And so he had had the record for the highest altitude rescue at 18,000 feet. And someone on Mount Everest had just broken it at 24,000 feet. Jeez. And in order for that pilot to do that, when they landed, they didn't have enough lift to take off. So the air was just too thin for the helicopter to take off. So they yeah. stripped everything out of the helicopter that they could, you know, every bit of equipment, non-essential personnel still didn't have enough lift. So that pilot just pointed the nose down the hill. I'm like, well, helicopters on skis, skied the ship down the hill under full power until they could finally you know, yeah. take off a little bit. And luckily that happened before they ran out of mountain. Yeah. Dude, that's crazy. Cause I've seen a video where a helicopter was attempting to do that, not on the same mountain, but on some mountain with snow and the props hit the snow, relatively soft snow and it shattered the props. You know what I mean? Because the, you know, the, the, they're going around at such a high RPM that when they hit that stuff, you know, they're, you know, they're not metal. The props are pretty, you know, sometimes they're very light material, but it, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, shout out to Eddie. And, uh, yeah. you know, awesome. if, uh, if, if anyone hasn't interviewed Eddie by now, someone needs to interview Eddie because I'd, I'd watch that. I'd watch that oh, in space. Too. I would love to hear yeah, all the awesome. stories. Yeah. Yeah. Eddie's somewhere like, man, that dude. <laughs> And you know what? You got to think 6,000 feet at that level is like beating the hundred meter dash by like two seconds. <laughs> it's, it's gotta be serious, right? Like you went from 18 to 24,000. Eddie's probably like, man, I can't even get to 20. Uh, the last time I went to 20,000 feet was like 20 years ago. I'm never going to get this you know, record back kind of thing. Well, the highest um, I'd ever crazy. been in a helicopter was about 14, five. And mm -hmm. even then the helicopter just every once in a while, flying along and just like jerk, <laughs> just randomly like, yeah. it's like looking for air. Yeah. And I just remember thinking, like, huh, I have a slight headache, and I'm smiling more than usual. Yeah. There must be men up here. <laughs> yeah. And I was acclimated what? to 7,500 feet, and it was yeah. still. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sometimes I wonder how the people, that you know, air crew people do it. I'm like, man, you guys, you know, and then they, they wonder why they're so wonky when they get back down on flat earth. It's like, no, man, they're they're like oxygen depleted, like 75% <laughs> yeah. of their lives. Like, I don't understand. I don't think you understand what's going on. <laughs> um, So, you know. You, you get the opportunity to test some watches and stuff like that, but everybody's got like their own kind of way with timepieces and in, in history. And if, if, if you mentioned to me about being impact prone with yeah. your timepieces and being kind of rough. So kind of explain to everyone, if you can, like how you kind of live with your watches and, and the results of said living with your watches. Well, I mean, I don't intentionally try to destroy things, but I, every once in a while I'll just either get beat up or the gear that I have on me will get beat up. I mean, yeah. I think the best example of that is when I was out mountain biking one time and just on my local trails, I had, uh, you know, made some improvements to my bike. So it felt great. And I was on my warm up lap. I, no, I didn't even turn my GoPro on because the battery was low. <laughs> And so I was just doing like a little uh, warm up loop. I did it one time. It felt great. Didn't realize it. I set a PR on, on that little downhill section. And so I went to do it again. And of course I charged it a little bit faster because it felt really good. And then uh, the bike started to get a little squirrely and I figured I'd probably have to ditch it at some point. And we are like, okay, well, maybe I can just like hop over the handlebars, like tuck and roll and get out. And I'm not sure exactly what happened. If I grabbed a little bit too much front brake, if I hit a rock, but I went airborne and I stayed airborne for about 40 feet and landed on a small pile of rocks on my liver. And, uh, mm. but, uh, and after I, of course I got the wind knocked out of me. And once I caught my breath, I was able to hike back out and, um, and call a friend to get a ride and, Went home, took a shower because figured I'm probably going to be in the ER for a little bit and don't want to go all dirty. And I, uh, as I was coming back from the ER, like something just did not feel right. You know, <laughs> you're not feeling like when you clean your belly button and it just feels wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 
it felt like that all on my side. And so my eyes started mm. watering a little bit and I went to the, um, to the nurse's <laughs> station for triage because it, the lot was farther from the ER than I thought. And so just that walk <laughs> just felt wrong and like tearing up, sniff, sniffling a little bit. And, uh, I'm totally clean, uh, clean clothes. And the nurse asked me, so what happened? I'm like, mountain bike accident. And she's like, do you feel safe at home? I'm like, yes, it really was a mountain bike accident. <laughs> <laughs> and so go in the doctors are you know doing the, the doc he's doing his little assessment and then after a while he leaves the room and he comes back with um like a whole team of people I'm like oh i just got trauma activated didn't i okay <laughs> yeah. so it turned out that i split my liver in half um i broke about three or four ribs and kind of dented my lung i was yeah. wearing a seiko turtle not a scratch on it <laughs> watched wow. it just fine so, so A, I'm glad you're better. B, <laughs> we need to reenact this situation <laughs> yeah. to reenact the scene from Jaws when they're all on the boat and it's Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfus, and everyone, and they're doing, you know, their sea stories about their injuries. <laughs> we need to reenact that. And we need to find a third person because I got some good ones. I don't know if I, I, I can't beat a split liver. I can't well, beat that. I think the heart's still worse. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what does someone say when you're like, they're like, oh yeah, I broke my tibia. You're like, oh, I split my liver. You're like, oh, I lose. Sorry, I lost. <laughs> you know, and uh, but no, that's but hey, the turtle made it. Oh yeah, yeah, it's it's still ticking, still doing great. That's awesome. Oh man, well yeah, like I said, I'm glad you're better. And uh, you know, and I don't think people realize it either. Like, it sounds really simple, but when you are a firefighter, you bump into a lot of crap. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean, like. I always joke with people about how uncomfortable the existence is. And it, it's like, you know, we fall over all the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's just the boots are weird. The gloves are weird. Like, um, and, and thankfully, you know, you all use, you know, two piece turnout gear. We're using ensembles on a ship. So it's like, you know, I'm six, two, like right now I'm two sixty, but I was like two forty five the whole time I was in the Navy. And it's like, so SCBA face pieces for the longest time on my ships, I was the only guy that wore a red SCBA face piece. Cause I got a big ass head and you know what I mean? Like people be like, Oh, this is chief's face piece. <laughs> and it's like, look, I can't, I can't help how big my face is. I mean, we don't to do about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, no one ever wore the small face piece, which I can't remember. I think that's green. I think it's green, the small one. And, um, but man, I would bump into stuff all the time. I'd cut myself. I'd, you know, that's why I, thankfully I didn't know about watches because I just wore G-Shocks back then. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, you know, sitting in a, in an engine or sitting in one of your, you know, you got to be cramped in. I know you don't have everything on at the exact same time, but it's like, it's just a very uncomfortable existence and you get kind of used to living like that. So I think you just bang into everything and in general. Which, you, yeah. I think you, know, one of the you probably feel like you have more clothes on now than you do right now. Even though you're wearing like a t-shirt and probably like shorts like okay. me, I still feel like I got a bunch of crap on me and I don't even like really have a bunch of stuff on me. You know, what I mean? you know, yeah, it's I just think weird. one of the roughest things at work that I put my watches through is forcible entry. And yeah. so for that, you know, we get two metal tools that I'm just banging. Tell the us the tools, on. Asha. Tell us the name of the tools. Well, the Halligan. And then my personal favorite is the piglet. Yeah. I love that piglet. So <laughs> Oh, tell us about the piglet. We we don't have the piglet. Mm -hmm. I know about the piglet, but we have the halogen. So the halogen's my ride or die. But tell it, us about the piglet. It is just so much destruction in a small package. I just absolutely <laughs> love it. <laughs> it's uh, it, it takes two traditional firefighting axes, the, the back ends of them. So it takes like the flathead portion of the flathead axe and then the pick portion of the pick axe. So it doesn't have the traditional blade, but it just combines those two. Mm -hmm. And just the way that it's um it's compact just allows me to put a lot more force into my strike and so, yeah so there's no the that's a great point too the compactness right because you don't yeah. always have room to haul out swing it's not like baseball you don't have baseball room you know what i mean yeah. well, my firefighter carries the pig which is an eight pound one and i carry the piglet which um is a really good captain's tool because i don't carry you know a, a huge tool but i do need something that's very capable in case I've got to like self extricate breaching it out or do some forcible entry. And 
they both work great. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I, I, I saw one a couple times and I was like, man, I really wish we had those. And we have the Halligan tool. So for people that aren't familiar with the Halligan tool, it's basically a, a metal bar. I don't know, like, like this, like this long. Yeah. Oh, everyone has like 24 inches, maybe 30, mm-hmm. 30 inches. I think ours about and then you have a pry so. end. Yeah. You have a, 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 basically a pick and then another pry end. It's just, it's just, I would carry it into battle. Like I always, mm-hmm. I used to joke with my, I used to joke with my people, in my division. Like if anyone ever tries to board us, I'm grabbing the Halligan tool and I'm going to live the best five minutes of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, because this thing is great, but, but I think it's important to remember though, like, like you said, like that piglet's compact, right? Mm-hmm. And for a point for you, like as a captain to have to use that, it's bad. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you, you and I tell people that all the time in the Navy too, it's like at a certain pay grade for a certain person to be using a certain tool, stuff has gotten kind of bad, you know? Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of thought put into those tools. It's cool, but we never really want to use it. Yeah. Generally, I want to, I don't want to be like super close in. Cause if, if I'm doing something at the task level, then that means that I'm not seeing the big picture. But yeah. of course I still like to get in there and mix things up every now and then. But it's hard, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, it's I'm hard. such a worker bee that I just, and I just like to be physical at work, but, um, you know, if there's, you need to keep your situational awareness if you can. Yeah. Overall, so I say. I'm going to keep tabs yeah. on my crew. If I'm the first officer on scene, then I'm in charge of the overall incident until a chief officer gets there. But it's still so much fun to break things. It's my anger management. Yeah. No, I know exactly <laughs> what you mean. We're going to go to a a destruction room or something pretty soon, me and my wife. <laughs> nice. She's like, she's like, I don't know how much I'm going to destroy, but I'm going to sit back and watch you destroy stuff. I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. I'm just bring be- a Halligan. Let's have some fun. Yeah, <laughs> I've been... I've looked for them online and they're, they're a little obnoxiously priced. I might go like to a government auction and see if they have any old ones they're trying to get rid of for like 10 bucks. But yeah, I highly recommend if you have the means, I highly recommend you pick one up. Yeah. They're so choice, but, um, um, actually, so, you know, oh, actually with the Halligan, another thing that I love about it is if I'm searching, you know, the one end that has the pike and the ass yes. a little bit raised. So if I'm searching, I'll have my hand pretty close to that end and slide along the ground. So that way, if my knuckles hit the floor, I know that I've hit a drop off because we're operating in reduced visibility. Yeah. So I'm either come to, yeah. um, you know, steps going down or a hole in the floor or something. So that's just like a little bit of a pre alert for me. So it's a yeah. crazy versatile tool. See, and that's another thing I'm going to tell you. Hats off to to y'all that do the civilian stuff because, you know, just for example, I was on destroyers for a long time. And, you know, they're X amount of feet long, X amount of feet wide. And there's over 75 of them, but I, I basically know the layout in my brain of a destroyer, right? I still to this day think you could blindfold me. I could walk forward, aft, aft, forward, port to starboard and get my way around that ship, right? I don't need to see. I know where drop offs are. I can't imagine. I mean, I don't, it's so impressive going into a place that you have never been before and trusting this. $75 stainless steel tool <laughs> to tell you there's a lip there because people don't realize a six inch lip could, is a difference between you standing up and you falling down with 75 pounds of kit on you. And then a, no one knows that you fell down. Yeah. You know, it's nuts. It's nuts. And you know, I don't know. yeah. Yeah. But you know, usually in most buildings, there's windows and doors where uh, I got a decent chance of trying to bail out. I figure if you're on a ship, yeah. <laughs> there's not a whole lot yeah, to we, bail out into. <laughs> we're going to have this. We're going to have this. We're going to have this podcast one day. I, don't, I, I Maybe make a channel where you and I just talk about firefighting crap for 100 episodes. And, you know, Worse it is me. what it is. Um, I think it would totally work because um, you're right. Because it's funny that you mentioned that because, like, I, I, I was mentioning some of the damn, like, if I really had ever stopped, I mean, I knew mm-hmm. I've been in the middle of the Atlantic on something that's X amount of feet wide, X amount of feet long, X amount of feet deep. If I had ever really stopped and really thought about it, I rationally can't stay there. And how far away is your closest help? 
Exactly. Because I can get on the radio and we can call yeah. mutual aid from other cities, you know, get people. It might take them a while to get there, but I know that they're coming. Whereas on a ship, yeah. who's your closest health coming? Where they're coming from? My rationalization was I was in the Atlantic most of the time. <laughs> and at least it wasn't the Pacific. Because <laughs> I can't even imagine there. Like you're, 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 you're just anyways. But yeah, no, I hear you. We'll, we'll, we'll have conversations off the side. We, we, we can figure something out nice. here. I think if it's organized, it's going to be super fun. And uh, we can just geek out about firefighting. If people like it, whatever. If they know, they know. But, but um, so we've had all this awesome conversation about you and watches. And I know it's swayed back and forth. But all of this has led to you doing some really cool stuff with some charities and some organizations that you care about. So let's just discuss some of those because I'd like to close out the episode with that um, mm-hmm. for people to know. And then we'll do some of your recommendations. But um, some of the charities that you like and some of the organizations you like people to know about. And I'll include these links in the show notes for everyone watching or listening uh, actually um one of the first charities is the triple nickels and it's, it's just such an amazingly cool group um they were the very first group of african-american airborne rangers during world war ii nice. and they were they were never deployed overseas instead they were detailed out to the u.s forest service to become some of this country's very first smoke jumpers you know at the time when nice still very experimental and they were used to combat the threat of incendiary balloons coming from Japan. And they actually had the very first smoke jumping fatality. And this guy named um, Malvin Brown, he was a a medic on the, on the crew and he wasn't even mustered. The, I believe the other medic um, got sick and he volunteered to go in his place. And when he jumped, he um, uh, landed in a tree and then something happened with his letdown rope where he either missed the rope or uh, the branch that it was attached to snapped. And he fell 150 feet. Oh, wow. And so then his crew had to decide, um, you know, whether they were going to finish fighting the fire or get him out. And so what they came up with was six members of the crew broke off and then hiked his body out over 15 miles of rough terrain. So they could get him back to his family while the rest of the crew fought the fire. And actually, hmm. coming up next week, I think it's the All Airborne Battalion is um, hosting a, a memorial ceremony at uh, Camp Pendleton in Oregon. Um, it's called Operation Firefly, which was the name for the Triple Nickels. Oh, wow. And um, so they're going to have a whole bunch of people that are going to parachute from the same area that the Triple Nickels trained at. And they're also going to have a memorial hike um, carrying out a litter with uh, basically like a, a body weight worth of weight in the litter yeah. over 15 miles. So that's coming up. Oh, wow. But yeah. So, you know, I spent six seasons doing Wildland. And it wasn't until after that when, when, I, when I was done with Wildland that I found out about this organization. And so now the 555th, that was a unit designation. Um, it's since been rolled into, I think, the 82nd and the 101st Airborne. But okay. the Triple Nichols Parachute Infantry Association is um, is still going, and it is an organization for both mentorship, um, you know, keeping the legacy alive to get the knowledge out about this group, um, for camaraderie among military personnel, and so they they've opened up their membership to all jump rated military personnel as well as all airborne fi- airborne firefighters. So, oh, wow. so like 20 something years ago, I just, once I found out, I wrote to him like, Hey, uh, will you guys take a helicopter repeller? I'm like, yeah, sure. Come on, join us. So, um, I've been decently active with them. Um, doing like historical research for them. So they're yeah. very near, near and dear to my heart. Cause you know, those, those are my predecessors. Wildland. Yeah. It's such an incredible story that I hadn't even heard of until years later. That's and amazing. They, yeah, super cool. Other organizations um, have a lot of fun with the North Cal Women in the Fire Service. They do It's called the um, First Alarm Girls Fire Camp, and it's for girls nice. 14 to 18 years old, and just to give them an introduction into firefighting. And so we have stations set up, everything from auto extrication with the jaws of life. I usually teach the forcible entry station. Um, 
you know, put them on a rooftop, teach them how to to cut uh, ventilation holes. And I can tell you, I absolutely love giving 14-year-old girls chainsaws and, and the jaws mm. of life. Is, yeah. you know, sometimes they'll come in, they'll start out super timid, but then we teach them how to use it safely. And then just watching the smiles on their face grow. <laughs> yeah. know, we had um, a power tool station. And after a while, I just started calling it the women's empowerment tools. It was yeah. just so, so cool seeing how much more confident they were once they realized that they could actually use these tools. And we have yeah. uh, first aid and CPR station, teaching the basics of that, um, fire extinguishers. And they love those two stations because that's something that they can see taken back into their regular yeah. lives. And then, it's tangible. Yeah. Yeah. So it's tangible. Do that twice a year. Camps usually sell out within minutes. It's free for the girls. And then just operate through like, you know, fundraising and donations. And then, um, you know, another thing that I'm really involved in is um, firefighter full gear stair climbs. So we yeah. did two of those this year. We did one, I did two probably within about a week of each other. So the first one was for the American Lung Association. Um, that was in San Francisco. So full firefighting gear, um, breathed the air off of an SCBA, went up 52 stories to raise money for them. And then the week after that, went to Seattle for the largest one in the world, where there's um, 2,000 firefighters out there raising money for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And that one's um, 69 stories. Yeah. It's, it's That's the one fun. I donated to. Oh, I donated so to that. Much. Appreciate that. Yeah, I mean it, yeah. it wasn't much, but you know, it's a uh, everything helps. It yeah. all goes my, to a really good cause. Yeah, my my birth father um, succumbed to leukemia. Sorry to and, hear that. You know, no, it's it, you know, it, yeah, it's been it's been a while, but it, but you know, it was you, the firefighting, the leukemia, and which I've donated to Leukemia Society before, plenty of times, and I was like, you know, this makes sense. And I just dropped a little coin in there and uh, I thought it was awesome because it's just a, uh, it's hard, man. You, you, you know, it. you've obviously you've done it. You know, I've climbed vertical entry stuff with that kid on and it's not easy. Yeah. And for someone to go out there just to do with the chance of raising money based on the kindness of other people is pretty, pretty important. It's not as hard as anyone fighting leukemia, but it's pretty hard mm-hmm. you know, and or lymphoma. The things that, that they remind us of during the opening ceremonies is, um, you know, they, they're just really grateful for everybody that's out there. And, and it just really hits home hearing we have um, yeah. leukemia survivors and family members out there telling their story. And like, you know, I'm just, I'm going to go up there for, you know, it takes me, it took me 29 minutes. I'm like, okay, my little 29 minutes of pain and suffering is nothing compared yeah. to what a leukemia patient's going through. Exactly. No, and you're spot on with that. And I appreciate you doing it. I think it's pretty cool. Thanks. And it gets a face out there and it gets some exposure out there. And then maybe someone that just is cruising by digitally, you know, wants to help out. And it's, uh, you're right. It helps those people because there's a lot of stuff that a lot of things people are suffering from and a little bit helps, you know, with whatever that is. Yeah. So Asha, the last thing I always ask, I usually ask people for a hot take, but I want to save that for another episode. Because I feel like we have multiple episodes in us, so um, we'll save the hot take or the unpopular opinion for another time. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I like to ask people because I'll give you the full disclosure. When I do, I, I'm going to do a separate little intro for you, and I feel like because um, I'm pretty self aware, but I feel like you are a Renaissance person as well. You, you read, you view, you listen, you know, you do. Um, fi- well, I call him baseball five tool player. You know what I mean? Like, like Barry Bonds before the Royals was a five tool player anyways. But, um, so what are some recommendations you have like a podcast or, or a book or anything you would recommend for people to, to listen to? And I'll include the show notes for these two, and these in the show notes as well. Well, I, um, really like the hidden brain podcast, the psychology podcast, as well as behind the shield and, oh, and radio lab. I'll get to that one in a second. Yeah. So, um, there's two episodes in particular on the same subject from Hidden Brain and Behind the Shield, and they're both on sleep deprivation. And um, the one on Hidden Brain is about the guy that that helped. Well, I think he still holds the world's record for the longest time without sleep at 11 days. 
And the reason that he still holds that record is because Guinness Book of World Records has deemed that that is too dangerous to even compete in anymore. And that guy actually, later in life, he ended up having like a nervous break from it. And so he details that. But yeah. I mean, when you think about that, so so Guinness still allows people to, you know, jump out of a hot air balloon two miles above the Earth's surface. And that's considered perfectly sleep, uh, safe enough. But you can't <laughs> just stay awake for a couple of days. Yeah. And yeah. then the other one, I believe it's episode six of Behind the Shield, where they talked to a guy that was a doctor for what well, he was uh, a Navy SEAL. And then he became a physician and then he became the doctor to the Navy SEALs. So the SEALs would open up to him about things that they wouldn't tell other doctors because they were afraid that either they would get sidelined or that they wouldn't be taken seriously. Yeah. And so he goes in in depth about the effects of sleep deprivation on the body. And they're both really interesting. And then um, there is another podcast. It was a radio lab. I believe it's titled playing God yep. about um, a hospital during hurricane Katrina. And it's, um, it's all about triage. And this one's definitely on the darker side because a yeah. lot of their patients ended up dying. But one of the things that's really interesting about it is you hear their stories and then you um, hear like what went into all the decisions that they made. And then at the end of it, you know, it sounds like it's a long time because they're cut off from the world. They had absolutely no communication, no idea what was going on. They're just, they don't have any power. The water is rising outside of the, right, rising. They don't have any power for their patients that are on ventilators, um, yeah. they don't have, you know, air conditioning, anything like that. And then when they're going through everything, it just, it sounds like a grueling long time, but I believe it was only like four days that yeah. all these events took place for, but it's for, I'd, I'd recommend it for, you know, anybody that's in emergency services. It's a very good listen. Yeah. No, I appreciate you sharing those. Cause it's true. Like, um, time slows down for us that have dealt with these quick situations, but sometimes the time seems to take longer. It's weird. It's a weird thing, right? Like you, you think you don't have as much time as you do. Yeah. And sometimes you think you have more time than you do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you have to make difficult, difficult decisions. And the one thing that a lot of people do, it's easy to Tuesday morning quarterback stuff oh. when you're not in this situation, you know? Mm -hmm. And that is something that I think our community deals with a lot. It's, it's, it's a lot easier to critique said situation than it is to execute said yeah. situation. And you know, you then know, when, so. when you're in the situation, you do the best that you can in the moment and then go back, learn from it, do better yeah. next time. It's just, it's a continual learning. learning process. Yep. And that even ties back to the triple nickels. Cause I'm guaranteeing you mm -hmm. there's lessons learned from that whole organization, the history, you know, that are paying dividends now, like, yeah. you know, decades later. So yeah. good stuff. Well, Asha, it was, a, it was, it was wonderful having you on. I, I can't uh, tell you how happy I am about this and how much I appreciate it. Actually, I do have one more watch for you since uh, you mentioned. Let's do it. Let's so do it. have you seen this one right here? It is the Quali AWCO um, collaboration. Yeah. So the story behind this one is that this is a new old stock case from the 1950s. So the case, mm. bezel and crystal were all from the 50s. And so there was a guy that used to assemble watches for Blanc Pond. And you know, Squally used to make cases for them. Mm -hmm. So this watch assembler gave 180 cases back to um, to Squally a few years back. And so they fitted them with um, new movements and dials. And of course, me being a hazmat specialist, I had, yeah. to, had to get to know no rad dial I, in there. <laughs> I saw that and I was like, oh man. And I, and I purposely didn't Google search it. Cause I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm never going to find one. And it's just going to break my heart. But, yeah. Um, there's only 60 of them made. So there's 60 yeah, it, with uh, this, this dial um, combination. And then there's 60 yeah. with another dial and there's 60 that they haven't released yet. Mm, really? Yep. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm going to have to reach out to someone about the 60 that are sitting in abeyance because I would move a lot to get those. Um, Have you seen the Zen 
EZM7. That's the firefighter one. Yeah, that's a cool one. They're still around. So that's one I've kind of readjusted plans because I've been I've been denying it to myself. I've been lying to myself. I really want that watch. It's a cool watch. I really like yeah. that one. And then the other one, I always forget if it's the EZM12 or the 14 that uh, is the the rescue watch where it has the four blade oh, yeah. at the second hand, which is both yeah, functional. I think it's because, a 12. Yeah, I think that sounds right. It, yeah. It's functional because, you know, we need the 15 second timer to yeah. take vital signs, but it's also made to look like a helicopter propeller, which of course tickles yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's the universe telling you something right there. Yeah. And then uh, another cool thing about these ones is inside the case, it's stamped torn at Grayville. Really? Yeah. Oops. Oh, wow. So that was, that was the grail that I didn't even know I was looking for. And it's yeah. like, <laughs> this is. I'm sure Bill, I'm sure Bill over at Torna Grave would love to know that. Bill Yao. Oh, yeah. I've sent that, I've sent the pictures of that one over to him. So. Yeah. Bill's a good guy. Totally. But, good uh, peeps. Yeah. It really, you know, oh, we can, we could probably have a podcast about that too, all the good people. But, um, but Asha, I, I really, really, from the bottom of my heart, appreciate it. Um, it's nice being able to talk firefighting stuff with someone as accomplished as yourself. Oh, thank um, you so much. I've, this has been so much fun. So, again, super appreciate the invite. So, thank you. Oh, yeah. And definitely. We'll do it again. And let's let's definitely collab about something that we can have fun talking about uh, related to the firefighting thing. I'm sure there's something there. The groundwork's there. But do you have any party nuggets you would like to share? Any last coins you want to toss out there? Oh, I can't really think of anything else except just, just everybody just be good to each other. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, but for real, be good to yeah. each other. And and so on behalf of me and on behalf of Asha, you know, uh, just remember at watchrolling.com, especially in this case, you make the watch. The watch doesn't make you. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>